Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining another one of our AnyLine computer vision meetups. Today, Cesari is going to give a presentation on filter pruning. Um, as you go through the presentation, feel free to, to unmute yourself. You can ask Cesari questions. Uh, if you feel more comfortable, you can also open up the chat. I will take a look at it um, and we can answer those questions at the end if, if you have any. So um, enjoy um, and um, Cesari, I hand it over to you. Sure, uh, thanks. So hello everyone. Um, today's meetup, I will do a presentation about filter pruning. Uh, that's probably more interesting if you work in computer vision, uh, mostly when you have um, networks that have to run under uh, some computational constraints. So pruning is something that you normally do when you have, um, uh, when you if you want to make uh, the inference quicker on a, on a network or if you want to have your model uh, get smaller. So both things you can you can actually uh, achieve with uh, with pruning. And one of those um, one of the things you can prune away are filters. Um, but there are also different other different kinds of pruning. So mostly uh, when people are talking about pruning, they talk about weight pruning. So given a dense network, for example, like in the image here, uh, you can basically uh, prune, which means remove the connections between uh, between nodes by setting those uh, those weights to zero. You essentially remove them, the, their importance of them. So um, basically, if you um, if uh, you have a matrix representing uh, those connections, uh, you would set, uh, for example, uh, the connection to zero. Uh, what else you can do is, for example, node pruning where you basically remove the whole node and all the connections uh, that correlate to this node. So that would be setting the, the row, to the corresponding row to zero. Um, so both methods are nice and uh, both can be used to make, um, make networks faster and smaller. Uh, but there is another thing uh, because you not only in most of feature extractors in uh, computer vision models, you have convolutional layers. So what you can do is basically remove whole, whole filters from, um, from, from a layer. So for example, here you would have a input image or some input feature. And you would have, for example, four uh, filters. Each filter would produce uh, one feature map. So with four filters, you would have four feature maps. Um, likewise, if you would have uh, mm, an input image of dimension three, so with three channels, each filter would have three channels, but you still would end up with, um, with four feature maps. So basically, if you remove the uh, remove a, a filter, you also are removing the, the whole feature map. And since mostly feature extractors are based on a lot of convolutional layers, you can really get a lot of value uh, by removing them. And so the thing is though that, for example, if you look at an architecture like um, VGG16, so just a standard architecture for feature extraction of images, 90% uh, of the weights are in the fully connected layers. Uh, so 
so uh, so there are mostly after after um, all those convolutional layers. Normally, you have some dense layers, fully connected layers, uh, but they account for one percent of the total floating point operations. So what that means is that if you basically just uh, prune out, uh, remove filters out of your network, uh, then you mostly will not gain that much, uh, that much of uh, that much of a um, gain uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the size of the model. Uh, but of course, uh, what you what you get is the speed up anyway. But what you can do is actually, if you prune uh, the, the the filters of the last convolutional layer, uh, then you have basically. So the last convolutional layer before the that is then connected to the to a dense layer, you are actually also removing the connections to the dense layer, and that's where you actually a lot of weights away so if you want to basically basically if you want to um, gain in so have smaller size of your model you would probably try to prune uh, the last convolutional layer just before the connections to the dense layer uh, now if you do this just uh, prune from the last convolutional layer you most probably want you, you will have definitely some uh, speed up in the inference time, but uh, most of the inference speed you would get if you, for example, uh, prune, remove filters out of the first few layers, first few convolutional layers. Uh, most notably, the ones before the first, first pooling operation. Uh, the reason is that if you, if you have like an input image, you do some uh, you use some filters on those images but those images are have the original size so each filter is basically going through all the image to extract the features so you have a lot of computation which is uh, happening there after a pooling layer then you basically you get i don't know half the half the size of the image the number of uh, the number of convolutions gets less and less with each pooling layer. So what you want to do, basically, the most notable speedups you will see uh, if you try it, you will see that basically if you remove uh, filters out of the first layer, so uh, filters that might that are not as abstract as the ones in the in the last convolutional layer, then you will have. Uh, you will see uh, quite a gain in speed, and um, in the in when the in the last convolutional layer, mostly the the feature maps are very very small. So, so um, so convolu con uh, the convolutional costs are not as high. So you will have some inference speed up, but not that much. And so. Uh, some terminology when it comes to pruning. So I just want to um, in introduce some terminology. I think it's good to know if you're starting out with pruning uh, because a lot of papers are using those and some of them might be a bit uh, confusing or uh, the explanations differ sometimes. So uh, people are talking normally uh, about unstructured pruning or structured pruning. So unstructured pruning would be, for example, weight pruning that we saw before. Mm, you, you get the compression advantages because you have those matrices with zeros in them. So some compressing, compression algorithms can work with that quite well. And you really can see that uh, the net, networks are smaller. Uh, but the inference uh, speed is dependent on low-level implementation. That's because you have this matrix and this matrix is multiplied. And uh, how the multiplication goes on is actually something that is 
uh, dependent on how it is um, how it is implemented. So for different architectures you are running uh, it on, you will have probably different results. And if you basically are running on different devices, let's say you write the model for mobile devices or embedded devices and for multiple different ones, then mostly you will have to deal with different architectures, which might not be which might which might not be that interesting then. And um, but because pruning by itself will be most is mostly used for uh, for for these situations where you want to run the model uh, on an embedded device on some smartphone where you actually don't have as much processing power so not as many computing resources so what you want to do is um, have a small model such that it loads into the memory really fast but also at the same time you want uh, the model uh, to be to be fast uh, such that the inference time is is, uh, is variable and so we can then turn to structured pruning structured pruning is basically when you remove whole objects out of the out of the networks so filters for example nodes uh, channels layers uh, and so on and here it's not anymore um and here it is not anymore dependent on the architecture uh, that you gain that that you gain inference uh, an inference speed up because you're basically completely removing the filter for example and this computation isn't done anymore and the compression you get anyway and uh, more generally, if you have, um, for example, a tensor a W and you have some, some n-dimensional tensor, uh, then if you, you can basically um, interpret this as S1, many independent parameters of size S2 times S3 and so on. And basically, for example, in this example, you, you would have this weight matrix or whatever. The one indicates, for example, the first uh, the first uh, the first uh, feature map, and then, uh, for example, the first um, the first filter, then the first uh, um, channel in depth of the filter and those would stay the same so you would basically set uh, set the channel to zero of the of the respective filter and basically the higher you get in the hierarchy and the more you pick here uh, the more unstructured you get so if you want to do structured pruning uh, if you look at it from an abstract point of view in in this case in a pythonic way of uh, not, noting it uh, you that the the more uh, uh, the more you the more free variables you left leave here the more structure to get uh, so what's the workflow for pruning uh, normally you don't prune and that's it normally you you first you have some network baseline network that is already trained you look at the, you have to kind of um, make some ranking of um, of important and unimportant no neurons or uh, filters or whatever you want to prune. Uh, because at some point you have to decide what, what you want to prune. And the least important, important claim on some data and uh, after uh, and after a while you hope that um, that the accuracy doesn't drop too much that it can reach the accuracy from before 
in, in per perfect case scenario, or even uh, get even a bit bigger. Uh, but in most cases, you, 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 you don't want to lose too much accuracy there. And this fine tuning is mostly just for a few epochs. Well, that also depends on architecture and all, all, and all of these things, but mostly you, you don't do it for too long because uh, you have to think about it like that if you, for example, remove something from the network, um, the other weights in the network have to basically adjust to that, that those, this, this weight uh, basically went away. So the responsibility of the accuracy of the network uh, lies in the other neurons and so on. So they have to adjust a bit. And then you basically make the decision, do you continue pruning or no? And normally, uh, if you basically prune too much away before, before uh, fine tuning, you will probably lose too much accuracy. So we want to tune this basically the, the, um, the effect on how much you, you're removing before fine tuning. And then you can decide if you, if you want to continue pruning or not. Uh, that depends if if you still want to prune and you see that the, the accuracy still is um, still is uh, still is still good. Then probably you want to continue pruning and see how far you can get with it. And yeah, and I will just present like two papers that are quite recent. I think one is from this year and the other is from the last year about filter pruning and i thought that they are quite interesting because they they use very different approaches and let me check how to how i can share something else let's stop sharing and then share again um yeah this one. Mm. Mm. Can you see that or I'm not sure now. Yeah, we can see it. A uh, whole paper or because it shows me kind of. Uh, I, I just see a portion. I just see a portion of the page. Ah, yeah. That's. I don't know why it shows me just the portion. Mm. Give me a second here. Mm. I'm sure I can. Now it should be. Uh, do you see the whole, whole uh, paper now? I think it should be fine. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, so, okay, yeah, if there is something, then please write me. Um, so that's a paper um, that's called H-Rank, uh, Filter Pruning Using High-Rank Feature Maps. And so what they are uh, doing basically is they are looking at uh, feature maps that have have a high rank and they are saying if a feature map has a high rank then it's important if it's a low rank feature map then you can basically uh, you, you don't need it basically so you can prune it away and um, of course this gives some insights that if you uh, if you do some weight pruning 
you are always kind of limited because of the how the how the stuff is implemented in the hardware or in the libraries as i as i mentioned before um if you remove entire filters you don't have this problem and then they they nicely basically um split it into two uh, ways of filter pruning uh, one that is property uh, based on property importance and one based on adaptive importance. With property importance, you are basically looking at the properties of the convolutional network itself. Either you look at, uh, you can look at the images themselves or you, you look at the feature maps or the filters. And the other, so this paper, uh, shows a property importance based approach. And there are also adaptive importance based approaches, um, which uh, I will show you in the next paper, one that has quite good results. Uh, those were actually uh, those um, pruning methods where have actually better results um, uh, generally but actually this paper had, uh, this H rank paper had actually better results than a uh, past adaptive importance based uh, pruning uh, methods. So what you are doing here is um, you're, uh, you're embedding the pruning requirement to the network training loss. So you basically retrain, uh, retrain the, the network, but with uh, some some constraint on on how you want to prune so the loss is basically not just the loss you would use for optimizing the problem you have but also there is the, the loss has to account into this this pruning um this pruning uh, requirement uh, but let's stay with this um uh, property importance based method for now. So in this paper, uh, they actually make this quite nice uh, observation. If you basically look at um, look at feature maps, so you uh, basically do forward passes on images, and then you look at the feature maps. And then you look at the mathematical rank of the feature map. So feature map is just the matrix basically and so you can compute the, the rank of it by by doing for example a singular value decomposition and if you if you see that it's the if if, if, if it's low then 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 you're quite uh, then you are fine to, uh, to prune it and actually one might think that okay the feature map normally would also uh, depend on what image you pass through the network. But the observation they made is if your um, if your images have some intrinsic distribution and you forward pass them through the network, then the mm, then the ranks of the feature maps actually don't change that much, so they are quite stable. So, for example, if you, um, for example, put 500 images through the network uh, from the same distribution it was uh, trained on, then you will see that the feature maps are often have very similar rank for each image. And so they showed it here empirically. Uh, they are basically putting batches through uh, different batches of images through the network and you see that the ranks are actually the average ranks are actually kind of staying the same and often they stay the same sometimes they might differ a bit but that's a quite an interesting observation and it basically tells us that this feature maps uh, well, the nice thing if you study those feature maps, they kind of have the information of the input image plus the filter. While if you would uh, just look at the input images, you don't have much information actually. So what they are basically saying is 
what I already mentioned, that those low rank feature maps you can actually prune away because it doesn't really matter what image of the distribution you, you put into the network, the feature map still is uh, equally important. So here they basically uh, say that this L measures the importance of a filter input to the CNN. And um, so they are here basically saying uh, if you, if you, um, if you sample from the distribution uh, and then look at the output feature uh, output uh, so the, the feature map of this image and the importance will be basically uh, around uh, the, it's estimated by the rank of the of the of the feature maps summed over g which is the just the number of images you are summing the rank through so I think they use about 500 to estimate the average rank. And so that's quite an interesting thing because that's not so hard to implement. And um, so what they are basically also saying and how they describe it is if you look at this, uh, this feature map of this input and you make a single value decomposition, uh, this sum will be basically longer and so you retain more information if you have a have a high rank feature map than if you have a lower rank feature map. So that's uh, quite nice and they have quite nice results, which you can check out in the paper. And the other paper I want to show is this GAL paper because it had also very good results. Uh, it's from 2018, so it's not not uh, not kind of not all. Uh, let me pull it out. Uh, this one is it here. I yeah, hope I'm sharing now the, the right thing. Uh, so that's, um, this one is called Towards Optimal Structure CNN and Pruning via Generative Adversarial Learning. So this is a completely different approach and it basically falls under this adaptive uh, based method. So what you're doing here is, um, so this idea is based on GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, uh, for people that are not so familiar with them. Those are the networks that are basically used for those funny applications like face swapping or, uh, or for example, uh, turning zebras into horses and so on. Basically what, the, the, the main idea is that you have a generator and a discriminator. Uh, you feed some image based on some distribution into the generator and it actually has to, has to construct an image that can fool the discriminator into thinking, uh, for example, that it's a horse or a zebra. And so for example, the discriminator sees what, for example, what how a horse looks like and how a zebra looks like. And the generator is generating all the time examples. And the disc discriminator says, okay, yes, this is a horse. Yes, this is a zebra. So the generator all, all the time tries to, uh, tries to fool the discriminator kind of. So in the end, uh, the generator learns uh, what's a valid representation of a zebra or a horse. So mostly those guns uh, are used for some computer vision, uh, computer vision uh, problems. And there are many different architectures, which is a, which is a topic of itself. But 
Um, here they have a quite interesting way to actually use those for pruning, which is quite neat, I think, because it's very different than other approaches. So you have this uh, set of input images. You have your baseline model that is already trained. And you have, if you put some input image out of it, you have this, um, so this is the feature extractor part. Then you have this fully connected layer, which then basically gives you the feature of the, of the image. And then you have the pruned network. So this network here got pruned in some manner uh, that's generated by the generator that also produces a feature. And those, both of those features are basically put into the discriminator, which, uh, which decides if, if uh, the feature came from the pruned network or, or from, the, from, the, from the baseline network. Because if the feature came from the pruned network and the discriminator thinks it came from the, from the baseline network, then it's actually great because then we found a way to prune the, the baseline network in such a way that it actually pulls the discriminator. So basically both, both networks uh, seem to have the same uh, accuracy then. And so they are doing that by introducing here some, some what they call a soft mask. And uh, basically they, this mask is uh, ba basically with each training step, it's, uh, they, they, they kind of try to, to, to um, they adapt it with each training step based on the loss here. This one is there to basically uh, make sure that those uh, features uh, don't deviate too much from each other. And then this uh, mask uh, gets basically uh, adapted and the, the channels or the objects with the mask zero get completely pruned away. And after a while, you, you, you get a network that is pruned. So here, for example, they, they don't just prune uh, filters, but they can prune like whole blocks and so on. And some branches and so on. So basically, it's an interesting method also because you don't need any labels. So if you, you have your trained network here and you don't need the labels uh, because you are not fine tuning anymore like in the uh, importance space methods. Uh, so that's quite different, inter interesting, I think, and kind of a neat way to, to use uh, generative adversarial uh, architectures. Yeah, there are some mathematical reasoning and stuff, but I will not get into it now. But there are a ton of papers on filter pruning and so on, and. They are quite nice to read because a lot of them have completely different approaches. It's not like fine-tuning some approach that is that is already fixed. And so uh, they are very kind of interesting always to check. Um, for example, I saw some methods to prune, for example, that says that it might be even better to, if the network is big enough to to prune whole layers instead of filters. There are also papers, I think, at NeurIPS this year that that are looking into actually pruning, uh, but without training first. So you are starting, so you don't have the the, the weights. You have no, in, you have some random initialization, and you are pruning basically in the beginning. So from what I saw, they they definitely not get don't get um, this good as uh, of results, but it's probably the next step uh, when it comes to, to to pruning filters or other uh, parts of networks. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, then feel free to ask. 
And I have to see how can I actually move it in my chat. Down below, Cesare, you can click um, in the Zoom window. There's a chat. Um, so far, the one question we have from Al was more about whether or not there would be a demo um, to show the structured versus structured run on a small data set. Mm. Um, no, I, I didn't prepare anything like that. Um, yeah, you, you will probably you will find some basic um, basic implementation on some GitHubs where you can check it. But uh, I didn't prepare anything uh, in this direction for for this talk. Sorry for that. Uh, hello, can I ask? Does anyone you? else have any questions? Feel free to. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I just want to discuss with you something. Is it okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned earlier, like we should prune the layers or filters before the first pooling layer. Uh, does it really make sense? Because I don't, don't understand why. Because the first layers would extract the high level feature. And then if we remove some of them, that would be the case that it cannot extract the correct ones. What do you think? Well, from my experience, uh, when I looked at it, um, I al always found some filters in the first few layers or in the, in the, um, in the later layers that are basically uh, maybe not that helpful as others. So, for example, um, I looked at, for example, the H rank, and you have, for example, often layers that have basically rank one. Okay. Uh, so they don't uh, actually give you anything, any feature. You you don't get any feature out of them, any valuable feature. Okay, if it's the case, why don't they remove it from the start? Like when they design the architecture of the DNN models, why why do they still keep them? Well, uh, you, you, well, in training time, you, you still, you don't know beforehand which will, which filters will end up being not so, uh, not so important. It depends on your uh, data set. Um, with different data sets, you will have different uh, feature features that are more important. So you cannot remove them a priori from the VGG network. I see. Also, also you want to keep uh, more filters. Mm -hmm. uh, in normally your network is over parameterized anyway, which is for training it's good, but for for doing uh, for doing uh, inference later on it slows you down, and you mostly don't need feature maps or uh, some filters or weights and so on. Yeah, I see. And another question would be like, can we successfully apply the pooling method on other small networks like efficient net or squeeze net or mobile net? Uh, definitely you can. Okay. So mo mobile net, uh, mobile net is sometimes even, um, sometimes um, mentioned in those pruning papers because it's basically uh, people don't prune on mobile net, but it's intrinsically uh, basically um, from the beginning uh, is optimized for for being uh, small and fast. So uh, you have this um, uh, depth-wise uh, convolutional uh, computations. Uh, so they are from what I understand, they, they are, the mobile net is already small enough so people don't do pruning on them, but I'm sure you can do it too. Because uh, in the end, you, you also will have some uh, feature map or some, some filters. It's just that 
the effect how how those are computed is different for mobile net and for other networks uh, network architectures you you also can prune them uh, you can prune some uh, resnet architectures and uh, whatever you just have to make sure uh, make sure you i don't know uh, for residual networks you what you prune the whole blocks and so on okay but basically you are not uh, uh, not um, kind of um, limited to to those vgg architecture or something like this you can really uh, do filter pruning for where you have filters yeah, okay Thank you. No worries. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions, maybe? So you can ask now, or actually you can also write me an email, so I can I will answer you if you have some particular question or you need some uh, some direction. Well, if no one else has any additional questions, um, I've put this already in the chat, but of course we've recorded the presentation um, probably by next week. We will also take the presentation and put it on our AnyLine YouTube channel. There is a computer vision playlist um, where we put all of, all of our recorded presentations. So um, you are more than welcome to go ahead and listen to Cesare's presentation again, or to any of our past um, meetups if you'd like to. Um, at the moment, of course, with, with the situation, we're going to continue doing our meetups virtually. Um, we've been trying to keep them underneath an hour. Um, if you have any feedback or something that you'd like to see in the future, please feel free to reach out, um, send a message in the board, send me a personal message through Meetup. Um, if you have an idea for a presentation you'd like to give, uh, also please let me know. We, we'd happily open up um, to the community to also give um, presentations. Um, so thanks so much, Cesare. Thanks so much for doing a presentation. We really appreciate it. Thanks, no worries. Um, wishing everyone a good rest of the year. Um, a happy new year. We'll catch you again um, at the end of January for our next meetup. So keep an eye out on the page and we will let you know our next guest speaker. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank See you, you all next year. Bye. Bye.